this morning. Uh, but it's something which we've been looking forward to hearing uh, as we've been here. And we, which we know numbers numbers of people participated in. I also know that an hour is not an adequate time to give you the opportunity to give a full presentation. But uh, because of this advocacy day, uh, we have many other people asking to be heard as well. So after we hear from Commissioner Squirrel, we'll take a brief break from committee members. Agreed. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, for the record, Sarah Squirrel, Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health. Very pleased to be here today to be presenting our Vision 2030, which is a 10-year plan for an integrated and holistic health care system. Um, I just I think this room is representative of the urgency and importance in terms of attention on our mental health system of care. Um, I also want to thank the enormous amount of stakeholders, community members, and Vermonters who came out in our listening tour and participated. Um, I also, we have several members of the think tank who are actually in this room today. Um, I want to thank uh, Vice Chair Representative Donahue, um, Representative Rogers, who participated on the think tank. And I would just, members of the think tank or the advisory committee, if you could please raise your hands and just be recognized in this room. Thank you all. Yes. Um, so from my vantage point, we sit at a critical juncture in our mental health system of care, um, and also as an overall health care system. And in the past 10 years, Vermont has absolutely solidified itself as a leader in health care. Um, and at the same time, despite our strength and determination, we still find ourselves having gaps in that system. Vision 2030 articulates and provides a vision and the strategic actions to achieve a holistic health care system that we think will benefit Vermonters for generations to come. Today we'll be providing an overview of that plan. Um, and for committee members, in case you're wondering what you might be reading this weekend, I've answered that question for you. Um, it is 80 pages. Uh, there's a lot of information in here, including an appendices that really walks you through all of the detail of how we did this work, how we did stakeholder engagement, and other information. So I would encourage you all to take a deep dive into the report. We'll be doing a high-level overview today, and we'll likely come back to the committee to do a deeper dive into some of the content areas of the report. So our charge, why did we take on uh, this task? Uh, back in January of 2019, the Department of Mental Health was actually tasked by the legislature to conduct a comprehensive evaluation of the overarching structure of our mental health system of care and to articulate a long-term vision about how mental health care can be integrated within a comprehensive and holistic system of care. We at the Department of Mental Health took that charge very, very seriously. Uh, we committed to a process to come together um, to strategically align around a 10-year vision because I fully believe that if we don't know our end state, then we don't know our next steps, and we have to articulate the short-term, mid-term, and long-term strategies and actions to get us there. We are emboldened and inspired by the aspiration that we could build a system for the future and for the now, and an integrated system that will benefit us all as we move forward. Vision 2030 is a vision with an actionable plan to help us get there. As I mentioned, it was informed by hundreds of Vermonters, residents, and stakeholders who came out to participate in our listening tour. And it weaves together the health needs of Vermonters into actionable strategies that will allow us to take policy into practice. One of the foundational pieces of the charge was that this process was inclusive. Inclusive of stakeholders and voices who are absolutely urgently important to our mental health system of care, including peers, advocates, those who identify as having lived experience, providers, healthcare providers, mental health providers, all coming together to articulate a vision. We conducted our listening tour using the framework of appreciative inquiry, um, and that really helped us look forward. Um, forget everything you learned about change management 101, systems and people as problems to be solved. Um, appreciative inquiry is really, about, is really about illuminating the best of what is, building on our strengths, and looking at what could be in the future. And we utilize that framework to create a context um, for hopes and aspirations for where we want to go over the next 10 years. We held five listening sessions across the state of Vermont 
in Vermont communities, um, sitting with community members, um, listening to the needs, hopes, and aspirations of those who are invested in our system of care. We then took that vision, um, the hopes and dreams of Vermonters, and we turned to a think tank, uh, which was a incredible group of stakeholders um, and other individuals who came together and had the daunting task of synthesizing all of those ideas and vision into an actionable framework. The think tank met five times, full day meetings um, in early fall, mid fall to early winter. We also had a think tank advisory group um, that was comprised of other stakeholders. They provided incredible input and feedback to us, were a great touch point for us just to reflect on the report and where we were going. And I want to thank the think tank advisory group for their contributions. The adult and children state standing committees also reviewed the plan and the review and they reviewed the recommendations. This was also open to public comment, which we received over 52 public comments online, which were also taken into consideration in the drafting of the report. So Vision 2030 really aims to provide Vermonters with access to whole health, person-led care that achieves the triple aim or the quadruple aim of health care. That includes improving client experiences, improving the health of populations, reducing costs of care, and improving health care provider experience. We also wanted to illuminate what does the word holistic really mean? And when we think of holistic, we think of it as something that is interconnected and only explicable and understood are understood by reference to the whole. Essentially, what that comes down to is that there really is no health without mental health um, and that they are connected. By fully embracing this and working to collectively address this, we think that Vermonters can achieve improved access to care, be healthier, and the state will realize significant economic benefits. A little bit about the history and some of the foundational guiding framework for this work. One of the main charges was to really think about the integration of mental health within a holistic health care system. And I think it's really important that we understand that is fundamental to this charge. Since the deinstitutionalization of mental health care began in the 1950s, states have been redirecting their primary services to community-based care. And with the recent passage of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act in 2010, the landscape of healthcare overall has evolved towards outcomes-based model of service delivery and system design. So essentially, national trends and practices are moving towards integration of mental health care and physical health care to improve access, quality, parity, and efficiency. And that is really fundamental to our vision for 2030. We also know that successful implementation of Vision 2030 will require buy-in and engagement from many stakeholders, both within our mental health system of care as well as health care providers. So the Department of Mental Health feels that it is urgent and important that we engage you as the legislature in thinking about the creation of an appropriate structure, such as a council or board, that would actually have the authority to oversee and guide these strategies that require commitment to that vision of integration of mental health within the broader health care system. The next slide also articulates one of the fundamental values and tenets of this work, which is related to social contributors to health, aka social determinants of health. Central to our 10-year plan is the recognition that the health of individuals is improved based on the health of our communities and our environment and the fabric of our society. So we have to consider to think about those areas in terms of the overall plan, a healthy society, a healthy environment, a healthy community, which can support healthy people. Social contributors of health are called out in this action plan and woven through all the action areas. This is a care continuum that we reference a lot in the Department of Mental Health when we think about our continuum of care, that we need to strengthen that continuum of care tip to tail, promotion, prevention, early intervention, treatment, and recovery. <coughs> All areas of the continuum need to be strengthened. Oftentimes, promotion and prevention, as we all know, are overlooked, and we prioritize treatment and recovery. 
We have chosen in our 10-year plan to equally prioritize all four areas of the continuum in order to enhance our system of care for Vermonters. This visual articulates how we have created and aligned this process with eight action areas that also align with the quadruple aim of health care. Within the report, we articulate eight specific action areas with those strategic short-term, mid-term, long-term actions and strategies. We'll be walking through each of those action areas very briefly right now to give you a sense of what the think tank um, and stakeholders were looking for across the system of care. Okay, I'll just keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> no, welcome to continue. Okay. This is very, great. great. Wonderful. <laughs> so action area one is promoting health and wellness. So essential to this vision, as we saw in that previous slide when we look at social contributors to health, is the concept of healthy communities, and health and wellness is really hinged on that. There also must be attention to providing support and thinking broadly in order to prevent family members, uh, peers, or staff from also suffering undue stress in their roles. So thinking about wellness for our care providers. Some of the action areas in promoting health and wellness include ensuring that we have culturally and linguistically appropriate resources in the communities, that we're continuing to partner with states, peers, and statewide programs to improve and expand resources, to expand insurance coverage for employee wellness programs. We have to continue to care for the caregivers and to support the development of trauma-informed, diverse workplaces. Each of the action areas is broken down by themes. I would also note that what you see up on the screen here is just a sample of what is in the report. Within the report, the short-term, mid-term, and long-term strategies are well beyond what is here. This is just a way to visually see how we're thinking about those short-term, mid-term, and long-term strategies that we need to build upon. The three themes in Action Area 1, Promoting Health and Wellness, are focused on practice improvement, collaboration, and workplace wellness. We want our practice improvement efforts across the state to be aligned with health and wellness promotion, building trauma-informed communities, and safe spaces that are person-led. In the midterm, we also want to focus on our younger, youngest Vermonters, enhancing the social and emotional learning for children, which we know is foundational for future success, and to work towards universal screening and assessments and statewide same-day access for care, which we know is essential. Long-term, we'd like to implement these approaches, focusing on universal screening, implementation of social and emotional platforms such as MTSS and early multi-tiered systems of support in schools, looking at the health benefits that meet our employees' needs, um, so the people coming to work every single day in our mental health system of care feel well supported, and looking at the wide use of wellness coaches. Action area two is related to influencing those social contributors to health. When we think about social contributors to health, there are conditions in which people are born, live, work, play, and age that affect a wide range of their health and functioning and their quality of life. The Centers for Disease Control says that these conditions, which constitute place, must be thought of in the larger context. So ensuring that Vermonters' most basic needs can be met is essential to building healthy communities. Basic needs such as food stability, housing, transportation, affordability, accessible childcare, and employment, we know that all of these factors influence and impact our overall health and wellness. We want to focus on ensuring that basic needs are met and develop a social policy agenda that aligns providers and community partners in the wellness model. Another area that was articulated, and this was articulated strongly through our listening tour, is continuing to build, empower, and sustain a strong peer network through Vermont. That is also up and lifted up and articulated in its own action area that we'll be talking about. The themes related to action area two, influencing social contributors of health, are in two buckets. The basic needs that we just talked about, 
and enhancing protective factors. In the short term, we need public education on health equity and mental health, again for our youngest Vermonters, focusing on social emotional development and learning. In the midterm, how do we continue to think about expanding support for housing, transportation, and food? We have another report uh, that we are have put forward analyzing our residential system of care. One of the main barriers to discharge from our state hospitals is not having access to housing. And again, continuing to focus on that expansion of social emotional development through programs such as multi-tiered systems of supports in school. And long term, continuing to address those barriers to employment, to housing, and continuing to expand access to high fidelity supported employment services and training. And we also, if we can get this right in terms of the social contributors of health, which we know impact long-term health outcomes <coughs> and costs, we have to improve our ability to identify and track the savings that we realize by these primary prevention efforts. <coughs> Action area three is significant and important to our mental health system of care and to achieving Vision 2030 which is eliminating stigma and discrimination. Many people in this room are aware, know, and may have experienced that many individuals who would benefit from mental health care and treatment simply don't because of fear of labeling, judgment, and prejudice. We have to recognize stigma as a real barrier to accessing care. There are several areas and strategies that we want to employ to address this public messaging through evidence-based and best practices, things such as mental health first aid, there are other programs out there as well, emotional CPR and other approaches that build awareness and understanding of mental health and wellness. We have to continue to educate and increase collaboration across all partners, including our healthcare providers, and ensure and work towards the integration of mental health awareness into the structure of our communities through the expansion of wellness centers and other models for community inclusion. The themes related to eliminating stigma and discrimination are education, again, social and emotional development, and wellness. We need to continue to support and expand initiatives that will engage the public and educate the public about mental health and supports Identify and provide trainings for schools and communities, wellness models and education. Our youngest Vermonters are our future. And from my perspective, probably the most open-minded individuals in our state. In my spare time, I run the Waterbury Youth Soccer League and I was um, uh, facilitating a tournament one day, standing under the tent, organizing all of the trophies and a couple of second and third graders walked by me and he was looking at his buddy as he was walking by and he said, you know, I was talking to my counselor the other day and she told me this thing that I should do to pull the plug and let all the anxiety drain out. And to me, the fact that this young man was talking to his friend casually walking across the soccer field gave me real hope for the future. In the midterm, we have to continue to implement collaborative anti-stigma and discrimination uh, training for nursing staff. We had many healthcare providers as part of our think tank saying, we need training too, we need to understand this, we wanna support our workforce uh, to be welcoming, to understand, and to eliminate stigma. So we need to consider opportunities to expand that across our healthcare partners. We also need to assess, measure, restructure, and think about the statewide standards and programming that could support eliminating stigma and discrimination. And again, fully integrate mental health education in all aspects of education, workforce, and community partnerships. Action area four is expanding access to community-based care. Vermonters came to us in the listening tour, and this was re reflected by our think tank members, very concerned about access to mental health services and what happens when access is delayed. This action area highlights the need to improve that access to community-based care, but also the need to have a balanced approach to this as we look at that continuum of care. 
that capacity in acute care is urgent and important, but unless we do it in a balanced way, we will unintentionally create bottlenecks and impact flow in other areas of the system. So this area highlights continuing to assess gaps in our care continuum, improve client navigation supports, as well as increasing outreach and education in communities. The themes in this action area in terms of expanding care are public education, centralized resources, local and regional services, and evidence-based practices. There was a lot of discussion about how do we create a centralized hub of information? How do we ensure that people know where and how to access the care that they need? What could that centralized resource look like? How do we start to build upon it and vision that for the future? Expanding gaps in evidence-based services for Vermonters in terms of mental health treatment and training, particularly to expand and strengthen our workforce and continuous improvement on expansions to community-based programming overall. And to continue to monitor our progress in achieving the expansion of our community-based programming as we go forward. Action Area 5 is somewhat connected to Action Area 4, which is about enhancing intervention and discharge planning services to support Vermonters in crisis. A nationwide study that was conducted in 2018 by the National Council for Behavioral Health reported that those who have sought treatment, of those, 46% don't even know where to begin or how to find treatment. Vermont has 14 emergency departments across the state. In 2018, they saw more than 10,000 individuals, of which half were discharged back to the community indicating what can we do better to ensure that people know what resources and care and treatment they can access at the community level to prevent them from needing to go to the emergency department. These numbers are concerning since our emergency departments are not currently designed to provide mental health treatment or to coordinate that community-based care effectively. Vermonters who informed this plan advocated for an integrated care system with community investments and hospital diversion strategies. We have to continue to address the social and fiscal costs of relying on the most restrictive and highest levels of care in our system and provide more added resources that will save both resources and improve outcomes for Vermonters. So some of the highlights from this action area include clear, consistent messaging about where to get support for people in crisis, implementing practices that improve an individual's experience while in a crisis, education and training for providers, strengthening, on the, strengthening our prevention, care coordination, and hospital diversion programs, and developing alternative options to emergency department placements. The themes in this action area in, are inclusive of access, transitions, and outreach and coordination. We are well on our way in one of the recommendations of the think tank that is reflected in this report, which is the implementation of mobile response. Mobile response is an opportunity where we can provide essential crisis services to children and their families in a more proactive way before it hits a crisis point and before a family might find themselves in the emergency department. We were happy to see that this initiative was supported by the administration and is now a part of the governor's recommended budget for FY21. <clears throat> also looking at approaches such as the living room model as alternative care settings to emergency rooms, the think tank also grappled with and was thinking about innovative ideas in terms of how do we provide more mental health care within our current system of urgent care um, as an opportunity area to, to explore and ensuring that all mental health care teams are trauma-informed and that care coordination is more streamlined. And continuing to assess hospital diversion programs to ensure that Vermonters have access to them in times of need and in their communities and potentially an area for further expansion. Action Area 6 was focused on peer services and ensuring that peer services are accessible at all levels of care. 
Strategies to expand peer services across our system of care have been shown to have impressive potential and demonstrated outcomes in other states. I think we can do better in Vermont. Peers are a critical component of effective systems that serve Vermonters and can make valuable contributions at all levels of care. However, stigma faced by people living with mental illness affects the ability of everyone to benefit from having more of those individuals with lived experience working in our systems of care, and it's something that we need to address. So some of the high-level recommendations was looking to a peer-led work group that could make recommendations about whether and how credentialing and Medicaid reimbursement should be considered or implemented, which could provide a path to expansion for peer work in Vermont. Expansion of peer-supported models, such as our two-bed peer respite program, making peer supports accessible in the emergency department, as well as in inpatient settings. We have pockets in Vermont where we're doing this across the state but we are not doing it at a scale that is sufficient to impact the kind of social change that we would like to see. An exploration of new models such as peer navigators that can provide guidance through our system of care. That is one thing we heard over and over again, particularly in the listening tour, help us understand how to access and navigate the system of care, which seems clear to us is not always clear to the individuals trying to access the care. The themes in Action Area 6 are related to standards and guidance, informing program, and strategic placement. We need a peer-led work group that can help guide us as systems partners in terms of what are the opportunities for credentialing and aligning standards that could open up doors for federal reimbursement. Guidance and educational opportunities for community providers on the inclusion of people with lived experience and service delivery and continuing to expand peer services and emergency departments as well as primary care settings. We want this peer work group to inform the Department of Mental Health and to work with the DMH leadership on a regular basis to discuss opportunities for expansion and collaboration with mental health and healthcare partners. Action Area 7 is also fundamental to our vision 2030, which is ensuring that service delivery is person-led. The key to improving client experience in our system of care is building a culture of care that treats seeking care with respect and dignity and supporting people to lead the development of their own treatment plan, recovery, and goals. Person-led systems provide both expertise and resources to support an individual's goals. Strategies in this section present pathways to providing individuals to prioritizing an individual's needs, their values, their cultural identity and interests, even when care is provided in an involuntary basis. Some of the high level areas that we looked at in this action area are reshaping practices to include advanced directives so that individuals can take a lead in their care from a position in it when they are in a position of wellness rather than in a point of mental health crisis redesigning service delivery to provide same-day access and brief solution-focused interventions for people seeking help, and incorporating outcome measures and a clear system of feedback to understand how are we really doing in terms of continual improvement of person-led service delivery. The themes in this area are services and workforce. These include education with staff on person-led service delivery across the state. Again, ensuring advanced directives are offered and in place for all clients, no matter what level of care. And to really look at long-term, how are we doing in terms of implementing and reviewing our progress and ensuring that person-led treatment planning is implemented robustly across the state of Vermont. The final action area is, fun, is foundational to the achievement of Vision 2030. We all know that workforce is essential to our mental health system of care moving forward and to be integrated within the broader healthcare system. Without offering the resources, tools, and employee benefits our dedicated community care providers deserve, we cannot meet the urgent needs of our vulnerable populations. 
workforce development and payment parity underpin a strong system that will deliver high quality services and supports. Workforce development includes opportunities to support our emerging professions and roles in the system of care, such as peers as discussed in Action Area 6. Payment parity is also a part of this action area, which is something we need to pay more attention to in Vermont and have an articulated strategy to achieve it. It refers to equal rates of payment for the same services when provided by mental health professionals as compared to physical health professionals with the same level of education and training. It also includes equal rates of payments for professionals that are provided both in inpatient and community-based settings. Implementation of approaches from mental health, developmental disabilities, and substance use will be essential to achieving this. Development of new professions with the guidance of our peer-led work group, such as community health workers and peers. Training and professional development and diversity, inclusion, mental health and wellness, anti-racism, reducing coercion, motivational interviewing, and others. Again, focusing on payment parity across health insurers and expanding coverages for all services for Vermonters, regardless of their insurance. <coughs> the themes of this action area include capacity, quality, training, diversity, and inclusion. Also looking at our workforce recruitment strategies, working towards parity and reimbursement rates, ensuring that our workforce has appropriate supports, education, and training, to support our staff and encourage professional development. Also exploring additional methods for improving our diversity training, equity, and inclusion in our workplace and workforce as well. So that was an overview of the action areas in Vision 2030. And I have to say, Getting this plan across the finish line has been an enormous amount of work, but I also want to underscore that this is not the end. This is simply the beginning. The key part to realizing the vision for 2030 is implementation and what are our next steps. That will include ongoing engagement with partners, continuing to look at em empowering our workforce, and assessing and aligning resources. I want to talk a little bit about some of the next steps that the department will be taking immediately upon the submission of this report. Number one, continuing to engage the legislature in the creation of an appropriate structure such as a counselor board that can help us oversee this important work of integrating mental health and health care to ensure that we have buy-in from all partners and everyone is at the table to help us achieve that vision. The Department of Mental Health will take the lead and have already begun conducting an inventory and analysis of short-term actions and the resource assets, assets that can be further built upon or may require expansion. To also begin initiating short-term actions in the plan that can be supported within existing resources and the authority of the department. To initiate forums and partnerships for areas of the plan requiring mutual accountability that are beyond the traditional scope of the department. No single group is going to have the answer to some of the challenges that we face. It will require a collective answer, and we need to partner with folks across our system of care to achieve that. We also want to finalize the Department of Mental Health's 2020 to 2023 state system of care plan using information and strategies from this 10-year plan and include in the Department of Mental Health's Act 79 report an update to the legislature annually on the progress we are making towards achieving this 10-year plan. And of course, to evaluate and create a framework for monitoring and measuring success of the plan. <laughs> so that is, what, thank you. <laughs> that is where we are today. Um, again, this was an overview of Vision 2030 um, to give you a sense of the direction that our stakeholders and Vermonters came forward to articulate. Again, I want to thank members of the think tank, um, members of the DMH team who have worked so hard to make this a reality. I think it really demonstrates how, as Vermonters, when we come together, some of the opportunities for a vision that we can achieve, um, and we look forward to working in collaboration with everyone to achieve Vision 2030. Oh, thank you for that. Yes.
bringing this across the line uh, generally from a level of engagement that I've been aware of as I've listened uh, and uh, for giving us a, an overview here this morning. I think, uh, as we talked earlier, there was a lot of work that has gone into the bringing this to closure, to closure in the sense of presenting it. Yes. And so I want to thank you for that. Um, I want to just, uh, maybe I can make, I'd like to make a few comments Please. and then open it up for some questions from committee. I certainly have lots of questions and I know we don't have time for all of it here this morning. Um, I, I want to just acknowledge uh, at the outset that simply the language of the 10 year plan uh, actually makes a very powerful statement. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel like I've had the good privilege to be present at the choosing of some of that language mm -hmm. along the way over the past period of years. The fact that we're talking about integrated and holistic system of care, it's not something that just uh, we should take for granted. That language itself speaks volumes in terms of what I think this committee has tried to articulate over the past few years that we must see mental health as part of health care and that our actions need to reflect that. Um, and I want to particularly uh, acknowledge and thank uh, President Donahue as our vice chair who has steadfastly held that vision uh, amidst many, many uh, challenges. Uh, for that we've, that we've shared many of in this body, uh, but I feel very privileged to, mm -hmm. to sit at the head of this table as a chair and to work with Reverend Donahue as vice chair, who has um, uh, championed uh, this shared vision of creating a holistic system of care, an integrated and holistic system of care. And uh, that alone, having that on the front page as the title of this report, uh, I think, makes a powerful statement, and one which uh, I know I personally am committed to, mm -hmm. uh, and I believe our committee uh, has been committed to. As you say, this is a this is not the end; this is the beginning. Mm -hmm. But you, can, it's hard to have it's hard to think clearly about next steps if there's not an articulated vision. I find myself wanting to say, okay, now let's do, you, you use the term inventory, I'm writing down, like, okay, I want, I want to have everything that's being done placed within the vision of care. Mm -hmm. I want to have, I mean, and I haven't had a chance to look through it. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that there are references to many programs. We are faced with making choices on an annual basis. We, as the public makers and legislature, we live within a resource finite. Uh, not, not completely fine, but within a resource-restricted mm -hmm. environment. So choices have to be made, priorities have to be set. Mm -hmm. And so, but, but again, where are the priority, where do we, how do we make our priority choices, but we have a, within this vision of care. I find myself also thinking, I'm hoping and trusting that the Agency of Human Services stands firmly behind mm -hmm. your vision. Mm -hmm. Uh, the 2030 vision. This is incredibly important. We have a structure currently that allows for both siloing but also for integration. And so we have opportunities mm -hmm. by virtue of the structures that we have. And the leadership, uh, uh, it, the, the buy-in of leadership uh, is important. Leadership change. We're experiencing leadership changes in this very period of time. Mm -hmm. I've had conversations with other leaders in the healthcare world of Vermont saying, how do you intend to have your vision sustained mm -hmm. over time? And so I would hold that out as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you will not be the commissioner forever. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good thing for everybody involved, especially you. <laughs> but not for, but, but I mean, I say that meaning that as a, a complimentary uh, a compliment. Uh, you, you will move into other life changes and opportunities, as will we. Mm -hmm. How do we sustain? How do we sustain a vision over time mm -hmm. through transitions that are political, that are leadership, that mm -hmm. are uh, societal? So, um, 
but I think those are all those are all challenges that we face. Uh, but uh, we do it within a, a vision that's that's shared. I think what I'd like to do at this point is uh, welcome uh, our vice chair and Representative Rogers, who participated in the mm -hmm. uh if they wish. Uh, to make any initial comments, and they can not now. We obviously can make comment later, and then open it up to the committee questions. Is that well, I'll just say very brief, uh, briefly. It was it was really a, a privilege and really exciting to see um, this synergy develop. Where you know maybe different ways to articulate things in the beginning, but mm -hmm. so much consensus around um, what needed to happen. Um, the concept that our, our system of health care uh, needs to be holistic and, and that that meant total integration of mental health. But even to use references to a system of mental health mm -hmm. doesn't really make sense. It's a system of health care which incorporates, fully incorporates mental health as with all of the other components of health care. So um, it, was, it was really exciting to, to see that uh, so many people gathered together in a dialogue and sharing those values. I would pretty much echo that. I would just say it was, I think the process was really something that impressed me quite a bit. And I think coming in as a think tank member after the listening tour had mm -hmm. taken place and reading hundreds of pages, hundreds of pages. hundreds of pages of notes from the listening tour, I thought it was pretty impressive looking through hundreds of pages of listening tour notes how many themes were kind of shared amongst different locations, different groups, um, which was impressive and I just thought it was a really thoughtful process. And I want to add, it was really the leadership of the commissioner that made this happen. I think um, this committee, this legislature has sort of been pushing for, um, for this to happen for more than the past, just the past year, but it was um, the current commissioner who really took the heart and really made it happen. Really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And rubber then hits the road. How do you make choices and yes. how, how do you move things forward? Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're not going to resolve that here this morning, but I think that those are those are the kinds of things that this becomes the platform for which. And, and, and there may and there may be. Uh, this may need to both there needs to be continuity but there also needs to be a living document that is able to uh, respond and reflect uh, important changes that emerge as you know, new, new information new knowledge uh, emerges let me open it up uh, I'm going to suggest that we take uh, just 10 minutes more and then we'll take a break and then we'll uh, uh, and then we'll switch gears and we'll hear from other advocates and individuals who are here for mental health advocacy. Mark. Hi. Hi, thank you very much. Um, this is amazing work. I, I think I'm thinking about it in the context of my um, evolution, mm -hmm. professional evolution through the healthcare system over the last 32 years and how we um, cultures change slowly, mm -hmm. but how we in the healthcare system have not in the past done a very good job of prioritizing um, the person led um, part of planning the plan of care, and how um, sometimes, especially elderly patients, will say to me if I give them a choice, they'll say things like, You're the boss. and um, as an opportunity for me to try to turn that mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. um, so I really appreciate the emphasis on not only respecting, but prioritizing that each individual um, is empowered um, and supported in, in being the focus of their plan of care. Absolutely, and I think that uh, that really came through from the healthcare providers that were at our table. I know in one of the groups that I was working in, um, we had a, a leader from um, UVMMC um, who was really focused on how do I help train my folks to understand what person-led care really looks like um, and kind of embedding it in the broader provision of health care. Um, I think on the mental health system of care, we work towards it, we understand it, but we still have 
opportunities for improvement. Um, also, to your good point about um, our older Vermonters or aging Vermonters, I'm not quite sure what the right term is to use. Um, elders. Elders. Um, Has more respect. <laughs> elder Vermonters. Um, it is something that um, we probably need when um, uh, the committee chair was referencing this as a living document. I think looking at our geriatric system of care is something that probably likely requires more attention. Um, I was kind of reflecting on the report and where are some areas that we didn't lean into as much that are likely things that we need to be thinking about. That would be one of them. Um, so just to also bring that to note for everyone in the room that that's an area that we noted in the report um, that certainly requires further ongoing discussion to really think about um, how we support that system going forward. You, you talked about workforce, which we've heard a lot about in the last few weeks. Um, but were you suggesting that there might be a need for a, a different type of healthcare worker in this segment? Um, do we need to redesign the way people approach their jobs or what their jobs entail? Well, I think there are ideas um, related to, particularly when we think about integrating mental health services within health care. We want to ensure the integrity of how we deliver mental health services um, is held in high regard, which will require additional training for healthcare providers in general. Um, I also think when we look at our peer workforce, we have an enormous opportunity to grow and develop a strong peer workforce. Um, and to be candid, I think there's some debate about whether that should be a credentialed body, should it not be, um, and I think that's okay, but we need to have that dialogue because we need clarity on where we're going and what that may or may not unlock in terms of additional resources. Um, I also think even outside of our mental health system of care, our other systems partners are thinking about their workforce differently. Um, talking with Commissioner Sherling, um, the Commissioner of Public Safety, um, and his front of mind is how do I help train my law enforcement officers <laughs> to better understand mental health. Um, so I think it's our existing mental health workforce the healthcare workforce, and then more broadly thinking about anyone who part of our system of care, how do we educate and train? Um, because that will improve the experience for an individual at that given time who might be experiencing a mental health or health challenge. Can I just, uh, I don't know if this is, we have a current measure of this, but uh, when I was working in the field of mental health community mental health mm -hmm. some years ago, it was, it was, while it was evident that the pressures on the community system of care with designated agencies uh, providing community-based care was enormous and the resources were insufficient, at the same time, it was evident that, I believe, it would be clear that the vast majority of Vermonters who are seeking mental health care are going to their primary care physicians, mm -hmm. and that the vast majority of psychotropic medications Prescribed are actually being prescribed through primary care settings, mm -hmm. and that uh, both knowledge of, knowledge about how to make an appropriate prescribing and how to connect with other services that are needed uh, was was essential. And I don't know what the, what the landscape uh, what the data would show right now. I'd be interested to know that, mm -hmm. but uh, there are measures that indicate that there is a healthcare system that's providing mental health care, perhaps without the level of background and training and experience and connection to the, the web of, uh, web in a positive sense, of uh, supports that are available. On to Bill's thing, I'm yeah. just really happy to see about the navigators mm -hmm. in there, mm -hmm. because people just don't know what mm -hmm. to do, family members. And often yeah. I get the calls, you know, and I'll get the calls on a weekend or, you know, what do I do? And it's like, oh, hold on, I'll figure out something. Mm -hmm. But having a peer navigator also, mm -hmm. I think, is an underused resource, mm -hmm. um, someone with a lived experience, um, who is probably more trustworthy with the patient than, mm -hmm. you know, in the patient's eyes, than a doctor saying, this is what we're going to do. You know, where it takes all power or control away from the patient. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just I was very pleased to see those two two things there, and emphasis on navigators because 
I mean, people don't even know how to get a primary care doctor, but if they, you know, have a crisis, it's, where do you go? Yeah. You're absolutely right. Our, our services are only as effective as people's ability to access them. So ensuring that they can access what is a very complicated system from the outside looking in. Um, and sometimes it feels like eight doors to the same room. Um, so that's on us to ensure that our North Star of accountability is to those we serve and how do we make it simple to access services and to make them more accessible. Right. I have three questions. and. Um, I don't necessarily expect the answers for everything today, but there's some, Great. they're just yeah. questions, you know. Um, so one is, is um, how much did the think tank, I think that's what the group is called, not a task force, or a commission, it's a think tank, right? Mm -hmm. okay, so how much did the think, think tank and this process look at um, the barriers of cost for accessibility. Like I see a lot about like where services are and like the different kinds, but something I've noticed as a mental health provider is that people are having to pay co-pays and deductibles increasingly, and there's very few patients I have now that aren't on Medicaid that don't have a really high deductible or a co-payment, and that can be a barrier for people even when the system exists to actually using it. So I'm curious how much cost was looked at. That's my first question. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know that it was articulated as one of the action areas within, or one of the strategies within the actions was looking at the cost to access services, regardless of insurance or ability to pay. Um, so I think it, I, I know that it is noted in the plan, and that was yeah. something that the think tank grappled with. And I did see a part where it talked about like having more even benefits between mm -hmm. plans, mm -hmm. so maybe in that work it could be addressed too. Mm -hmm. uh, the other two things are more like point. when I think think of 2030, I'm like, well, okay, so we're going to get to 2030, and then what? And I, and when I think of the next mm -hmm. 10 years and what we're facing as a society, I'm, I'm and what's going to impact the mental health and wellness of people, two big things came up, um, mm -hmm. which may seem a little. Far, one of them may seem a little far-fetched, but it's real. So the first one is the impact of climate change and environmental disasters. Um, we, we are, we're hearing pretty consistent um, reporting from scientists now and economists that that's going to have a huge impact. Um, and people, there's this new term, climate anxiety or like mm -hmm. climate grief. You're starting to hear these terms throw, thrown around. Of people are actually coming in, in and talking about the impact of climate change affecting their mental health. So I'm curious if that was brought up at all in the plan. The, the next one, I'll wait and I'll ask it. Okay. Well, I think why don't you name your? Okay. Other the other one is the other one is the impact of technological changes. Mm -hmm. So, like, we're, we're technologically is progressing exponentially, and there's going to be benefits and risks. And on the artificial intelligence task force, we heard about how in healthcare there's going to be advances um, that might totally revolutionize how we treat mental illness because of the interfacing of brains and. Mm -hmm. and, but there's also risks, like the harm that technology is having on developing brains, the amount of technology use of children, et cetera. So I'm curious if technology was talked about like, in terms of its role, both positive and negative, in the, in the mental health system. Yes, absolutely. I think they're great points. Um, I don't know that climate change and the impact of climate change was necessarily a focus of the think tank groups, but it may have come up in a more tertiary way. But I think something that I'll need to think about, it is articulated in AHS's strategic plan. There's a specific section that is lifted up related to climate change, so that might be worthy of taking a look at. And then in terms of technology, I think we were probably thinking more about the benefits of telepsychiatry. Yeah. Um, how do we utilize that just given um, one of our biggest resource burdens right now um, is that we don't have the workforce that we're requiring or relying on very expensive uh, traveling doctors, locum nurses, particularly in our inpatient system of care. How do we use telepsychiatry more broadly? Also recognizing we have real limitations in terms of broadband access across the state of Vermont. So we don't want to over rely on technology to provide care for individuals if an individual in a very rural area of Vermont can't utilize it. So those were some of the things that we grappled with. I would, I would just take up something, Brian. It makes me think, and I think we do need to stop, but um, how, do we protect, how do we protect from the system that we're building now, not falling into some of the hurtful traps that as we look in retrospect, this legislature actually voted and passed legislation that allowed uh, eugenics and sterilization and hospitalization of people for diagnoses that today we would just look at it, we would we'd say that was just discrimination, that was wrong. Uh, I, 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 
feel compelled to just name that when I came into the mental health field, uh, the list of diagnoses included homosexuality. And that I, at that point, as a young mental health professional, had to look at that and then spend a good part of my professional and personal life fighting to help change a system that was in fact hurtful rather than helpful to a whole group of our society. How, how, how can we have the kind of lens that allows us to look at what are we doing today that 10 years, 20 years from now, we would look back and go, how could we have even considered that? And that may be asking too much of us, but I think at the same time, we have to have, we, we need to hold some of our history as a mental health system within our uh, vision as we move forward to, to, not, uh, to not forget that there have been, in fact, uh, the mental health system itself and parts of it even today uh, are experienced as hurtful rather than helpful by numbers of people. And so we, we need to continue to uh, keep a vigilance uh, there. I think that's exactly right. Today being Mental Health Advocacy Day, uh, I'm sure we're going to I'd love to have us hear about that in general, but uh, uh, we have had requests from numbers of folks to be heard in front of this committee, and we've been trying to accommodate as many requests as possible. Let me turn it over to you, Laura. Okay. Thank you, Chair Lippert, for having us here today. My name is Lori Emerson. I'm the Executive Director at the National Alliance on Mental Illness of Vermont. And this is our fifth year in organizing Mental Health Advocacy Day. And the organizers include NAMI Vermont, Vampire, and Vermont Care Partners. And we have 47 co-sponsoring organizations here today and their networks. Um, I think this is our largest attended event um, in the five years. We have probably about a couple hundred people here in the State House today. So very pleased with the turnout. And I especially want to thank this committee for all your support with mental health and for allowing us the time to speak today because I know you're very busy and we'll try to keep our comments brief and um, also want to thank you for the resolution that will be read in the House Chamber today recognizing Mental Health Advocacy Day. So, you know, we're really looking to help advance um, the mental health priorities here in Vermont and like you said, we couldn't fit in everybody we wanted to fit in today. So um, everybody will try to keep their comments brief. Um, and just to let you know a little bit about NAMI Vermont, uh, we're a grassroots volunteer organization. And we provide um, education, advocacy, and support to individuals with mental illness and their families. And um, we have a new program and we're starting to get back into the schools because we know that's a priority to be able to get education to the children in school and um, to be able to help eliminate stigma and raise the awareness about mental health and let them know it's okay to talk about your mental health. So I thank you for your time today and uh, we'll have the next speaker up. Yes. My name is Greg Barnett. I'm a psychologist, uh, addictions counselor, and I'm the legislative chair for the Vermont Psychological Association. And I want to acknowledge, as Representative Lippert just did, the phenomenal job that Commissioner Squirrel did with her report and presenting it. It was fantastic. And it does fit in with some of my comments today. So I want to thank all of you for your interest and commitment to mental health care and health of Vermonters. It's awesome to be here on Mental Health Advocacy Day. I'm very nervous for some reason, and I'm going to try to look up from my written testimony, all of uh, which all of you have a copy of. I know it can get kind of dry if uh, a witness reads off of his or her notes, but I'm going to try to do that fluidly as I can. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist with a doctorate. I have three master's degrees, one in psychology, one in addictions, and one in psychopharmacology. I have worked on the front lines of addiction and mental health for nearly 25 years. I have a close friend who committed suicide 15 years ago. I have family members and close friends like many of you who either currently struggle with mental health issues or have at some point in their past. That includes trauma, addiction, ADHD, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, a number of conditions. I myself have been in active recovery from addiction for nearly 27 years, 
And I have, you can see I have a personal and professional passion for this field. I have served on the board of directors of the Vermont Psychological Association for nearly 10 years, currently as the legislative chair, and it is in this capacity that I speak with you today. For years, I've also served the state of Vermont on many boards, committees, councils, task forces, work groups, and some of them are listed in, your, uh, in the testimony that I provided to all of you. I won't read through all of them, but some, for example, the, I served on the steering committee for the SIM grant, the $45 million Vermont Healthcare Innovation Project, Governor Scott's Opioid Coordination Council, a health advisory group for the Green Mountain Care Board, and currently I serve as the president for the American Psychological Association's Division on Pharmacotherapy. And as related to the work you guys are doing here, this session, Commissioner Squirrel had asked me to serve on the Rural Health Task Force Services Committee this past summer and fall, whose report and recommendations you guys have been looking at this, this week. And I find that that actually dovetails very nicely with Commissioner Squirrel's report as well in some very key ways. So my voice on the various boards and committees and councils and task forces that I've served on has been a voice for the mental health and addiction workforce that often remains invisible. That voice represents the mental health care of tens of thousands of Vermonters, just like you and me. That voice represents tens of thousands of hours spent in the presence of trauma, anxiety, depression, despair, mood swings, violence, and addictions, and the heartaches of Vermonters who access care from the over 800 mental health and addictions practitioners who work full or part-time in independent practice. As a workforce, we prevent emergency hospitalizations, we provide continuity of care when people are discharged from hospitals or addictions treatment centers. We work closely with first responders, with crisis teams, with designated agencies, with primary care practices, federally qualified health centers, attorneys, schools, the Department of Corrections, Children and Family Services, the Department of Health, recovery centers, and more. We are woven into the entire system of care. We connect with all these different agencies and systems, <clears throat> excuse me. On Mental Health Advocacy, Advocacy Day, my goal today is to bring into focus one piece of le legislation that sits before this committee and in the Senate with a total of 17 sponsors. H-139 and S-81 are bills that would allow the Board of Psychological Examiners to confer prescribing authority upon doctoral level psychologists who have completed specific rigorous educational and training requirements, thereby augmenting their current skills in mental health to prescribe and de-prescribe psychiatric medications. In every single meeting I've attended on healthcare reform and innovation over the last 10 years, and within every group that I've been honored to be a part of, there is a resounding and consistent message. There is a shortage of psychiatrists in Vermont and nationally. This is evidenced, as we've talked about today already, by long wait lists to see a psychiatrist, emergency departments holding psychiatric patients for days, sometimes weeks, and up to 80%, as Representative Lippert mentioned earlier, 80% of psychiatric medications prescribed by primary care practitioners, that's nurse practitioners, primary care physicians, physician assistants, often in 15 minutes or less, and often with follow-up visits sometimes months later. This message is that we must improve the mental health care of Vermonters. Prescribing psychologists, also known as medical psychologists in Louisiana, have been treating patients with talk therapy and the prescribing and de-prescribing of psych meds across the country and in the US military for nearly 20 years. What started and ended as a successful demonstration project in the Department of Defense in the 1990s has expanded to over five states. Other states are actively working on passing similar bills, and I ask you all here to consider helping Vermonters by taking up this bill for testimony this session. Vermont has some of the highest prevalence of mental illness in the country, ranked 43rd by Mental Health America in their 2020 report. We have some of the highest mortality rates from alcohol, suicide, and drug use. A Department of Health report last year showed the need for increased access to mental health services for those with concurrent addiction and psychiatric issues. 
we're in the midst of a drug and alcohol, suicide and mental health epidemic. While a promising tool among many, telepsychiatry, as we've talked about many times in the legislation that I work actively on, telemental health, with all of you here, is one tool, but it relies on and competes for the same small number of providers across the country. And it's difficult that that would meet the incredible demand that we have for services. After over 20 years of safe and effective practice by prescribing psychologists, this workforce is no longer considered experimental. It is acknowledged as an innovative approach to mental health service expansion at a time when such innovation is def desperately needed with such high demand. Expending independent scope of practice to other health practitioner groups like nurse practitioners and like naturopathic physicians to be authorized to prescribe all types of medications, including psych meds, is always a battle. We need all tools to help those in need. We need all hands on deck. Now, the Office of Professional Regulation, as you all know, whose charge it is to protect the public through a system of licensure of over 50 professions, has reviewed H-139 and is committed to sharing their findings with this committee. Based on their depth of experience, they've concluded that the education and training described in H-139 meets or exceeds what is required to prescribe psychiatric medications for doctoral-level psychologists, especially compared to other prescribing health practitioner groups that it oversees. Many support this legislation, many do not. We believe the opposition to it is unfounded. We wish to work collaboratively with psychiatry and medicine. They insist that this workforce is not needed, and worse, that it is unsafe. It is the responsibility of the Office of Professional Regulation, not other healthcare professional groups, to help determine the scope of practice issues. While excluded from the recommendations from the Rural Health Task Forces Committee, they had other very good recommendations in there that have to do with mental health, including restarting the nurse practitioner program at UVM, an interstate compact for licensure for psychologists, as well as getting master's level psychologists and clinical mental health counselors to be reimbursed by Medicare. They chose not to include this particular recommendation in that report, unfortunately, and I tried. So we believe H-139 is important legislation that can help the overall system of care in rural settings, in hospitals, primary care practices, and in our communities. I encourage you to view pres prescribing psychologists as a valuable addition to the healthcare system and the healthcare workforce here in Vermont, and I urge your support for this important bill, and I want to thank you all again for your commitment to the mental health and healthcare of Vermonters. Good morning, everyone. I'm Christopher Woods. I'm the Executive Director for Vermont Psychiatric Survivors. Um, what I, I first want to start off with saying what I did not do was look at any specific bills and say, to say I would want to support this one, this one, this one, this one. I thought it was much more important that you have an idea of what the peers are saying across the state about the goals that they would like to reach in terms of the way services are provided to them and the climate in which they're being treated now. So, that said, um, I am going to read a little, a little bit of this because, well, I am. <laughs> You're right ahead. Well, so um, the, the following is a list of recommendations that, and policy positions that um, we came up with uh, with members and allies while looking at data from around the country uh, with, uh, around a series of this that are, and these are guided by the advocacy goals that we came up with in our annual meeting as well as conversations. Um, the brief description of the points to follow, and I, I kind of, like the things I said to you, just kind of laid out in bullet points so it's easy for you to digest. So, uh, so um, we're going to start with the, the first one. And you did, I did actually send you the white paper. It's about a 22 page document, so we're not going to go through all of it. But it's essentially it's the support of the development of peer, peer center, and, uh, a peer respite and community center. Um, we brought this idea to you last year. Um, uh, well, number of us did, and that would be the establishment of six centers around the state, um, which would include peer respite on one side, where um, it would be two beds there, and then a community center. Um, the way we fell out further developed that idea, and, and that we would like to, for them to have central governance so that all training, all, uh, all the training, all the uh, 
support structures will all be the same, but that we would have a series of community meetings so that each community would make their center unique to them. But those centers would all have some things in common. Um, some of those things would be having access to um, other supports. Um, for example, you can all look outside, there's snow, it's cold in Vermont. Um, even if you often have to walk two or three blocks to get from the food stamp office to this office to that office, it's a barrier. And also, sometimes just for going to those very big buildings is anxiety driven driving for people. So, if you're going to, like, if so, we would not have offices situated there, but we would uh, give them uh, access to space so that this day of the month, food stamps are there, this day of the month, um, like housing and et cetera, et cetera. So that people could go to a place where they could be receiving support from peers, but also access the services that they need, um, because we thought that that was a uh, better alternative than the traumatizing experience of going to those places. Um, the other things we made, I know this will be supporting, encouraging greater funding and collaboration between um, um, peer communities and substance use communities. Um, a lot many of the people that we serve are, have co-occurring diagnoses, so if we're going to give the have maximum effectiveness, then we should be able to, we should be doing more coordination of services, and that should be something that, um, in terms of the, the almighty dollar, that you should also be encouraging um, to get me to fund. Um, and then increase in, in uh, I know that there's no extra money, but uh, there's a solution in bond. Um, increasing funding necessary to enable us to actually fulfill the mandates of Act 79. Um, that we focus on the go and, on end goals of specific initiatives to create opportunities with more access to funding outside of DMH. For example, instead of asking for more money for training peers from DMH, we believe that funds should be considered as part of the states to ask for federal funding, including that funding um, being funding for things like uh, for uh, vocational rehab. If I get a physical, if I have a physical injury on my job. Um, and I can't return to that job, I can go to vocational rehab, I can get money for training, I can train for another job, and that's just the way that it works. Well, why are we treating mental health issues any differently? If I have a mental health issue and I could be, it would be a bit for me to go through recovery coach training or IP, uh, potential peer support or you know, RAP or whatever that training would be, why are those things not also being paid for in economic services? Um, it's where we just got how many million dollars in the Reliant Grant. Um, so why are we why are we not doing that? That's, that should be something that you as legislators are pushing so that we can take the onus of as, as money start, starts to disappear in the next couple of years. So trainings like IPS, RAP, Hearing Voices, Recovery Church Training would be able to help people to return to the workplace and lessen the burden on the state in general. Also, um, this this tenure plan great, but there weren't a lot. There weren't really many peers who actually participated in that. So, investment in regular hearing sessions among consumers, peers, providers, and their support systems in the community to do some self-assessment on how DMH plans are having an impact on those using the system and the supporters. Nothing about us without us. Plans and evaluations of plans for peers are often done without the quick, without querying the very people who are using them in any meaningful way. Um, the information most often comes from advocates like me um, and service providers who each have their own agendas. Let's, let's be honest about that. Hearing sessions should be for end users to express their experiences and to that end we advocate also for the creation of a more transparent system for peer organizations, designated agencies, and peers to engage in mediation of conflict face-to-face, -face, but, that, but that mediation should include the input of the people who are being served by both parties in that conflict. Um, we all further support the legislation and regulation that aims to remove um, structural and systemic barriers to housing for people who live with mental health challenges, um, including discrimination and placement for seniors for nursing homes, sheltering for the homeless and victims of domestic violence, and the loss of housing as a result of any interaction with the psychiatric system by tenants. Um, next, judicial recognition and support of advanced directives. I know that may be controversial, but when deciding on forced treatment of individuals in crisis in the same manner we, that they should, it should be, we should look at it in the same way that we look at advanced directives for people who have other health-related diseases. If I have cancer and I say I don't want to take treatment, and then why is that different than saying I have depression and I don't want you to force drug me? I don't, I don't see where there's a difference there for talking about like what's going to happen to impact my quality of life. So we need to at least give them more consideration and weight than we currently do. 
um, the provision of a and also in, in terms of ONA sharing, what ha often happens is you know you're you're in an, you're in a facility like you say you're going to be uh, you're going to be you're going to have this treatment. You go to a hearing. There's no one with you. you there's no one to help prepare you. You're just there, and you're, it's for the, the individual who's in the hearing. They feel railroaded. Like um, it's like it's like um, it's like getting a public defender. Um, like there's no one is there. They, they meet you five minutes before. I've been like, well, sorry, but take this deal and you'll be fine. Not so much. So we would act for at least uh, the provision of a peer um, to act in a more similar way to our guardian ad litem, so that out, for outpatient um, hospitalization hearings, they have at least 48 hours of access to the person, help them prepare information, and just organize their testimony so they can actually defend themselves instead of just being in shock at the fact that they're sitting in the courtroom in the first place. Mandatory training of first responders on how to handle mental health crisis situations, as well as um, support support for the law that reduces the chances of fatal encounters with law enforcement. The new um, so that is the important plug that we make for um, the uh, new California standard for use of deadly force. And uh, we would like to see um, in the next six years uh, self-identified peer representation in the leadership of DMH at 20%. We know that's not going to happen, but if we can, that would be really great. Um, in terms of uh, some of the other things that are going on in the city, the ultimatum by the Brattleboro Retreat should give us all pause when we're considering the level of dependence that we have on psychiatric stays in all facilities versus communities versus community-based services. While there are individuals who might, might rise to the level of meeting its inpatient care, meaning would be better served in the community. Inpatient care is traumatic. It's often dehumanizing and fosters learned helplessness. Uh, so we support working towards community-based care and support. So with that in mind, we would like to advocate for the following actions to be considered universally as conditions for continued funding to hospitals that provide care. One. Uh, that they actually follow the Olmstead rules and discharge regarding discharge. Um, so whether a person has a place to go with support system or they're in need of, of a community setting, like um, group homes and other places that actually have open beds shouldn't be able to say, no, we don't want them because they're too much of a problem because that's why we're having so many long stays in hospitals. There is a place for them to go. You are paid by the state to take them, so do your job. We just want you to enforce that happening. Um, patients, that, patients should be included in all aspects of team decision-making processes because there are facilities where that doesn't happen. It is, um, we work with some facilities, one facility, where that does not happen. Um, you can request the change of your doctor every day if you want to, and they will take the request, but the policy for the, for the facility itself is that never happens. Um, grievances should be treated in a formal manner with written replies and said grievances should be made available to the relevant parties via an online database. Um, relevant parties being the um, Department of Mental Health, the uh, Disability Rights Vermont, um, if this is a facility that, that we are that we are working in, us, LMP, um, and uh, APS. Literature about civil rights, appeals processes, and peer support resources available to communities should be included in all intake and discharge packets for patients and not taken away from them. That's a big thing. You get like, everyone. Everyone always says, as they're discharging someone into homelessness, "Well, we told them that stuff, and when they did their intake, I'm in crisis. I can't focus on anything. You know, if you've been to the emergency room and your arm is broken and you're in pain, and they're like, sign all this stuff. You sign away your house and not know it because you just want something, someone to help you. So." Putting them in both packets doesn't seem unreasonable, and like at some point, going over them would be a nice thing too. Um, and then a dedicated and adequately reimbursed slot for community members unaffiliated with the facilities should be established in every employee 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 employee, employee orientation uh, to introduce to, uh, um, employees to the peer movement and let the advocates who enter that facility actually do. Um, if they actually know what you do, you're less likely to have an adversarial relationship um, and they can see that like hopefully you're there to work together for the benefit of the people who are residents. Um, the state of the march committed to also commit to the elimination of seclusion and restraint altogether, including steps required to attain this, beginning with all direct care staff recruitment, receiving regular training to the six core strategies to reduce seclusion and restraint. 
all of these things come together um, with the goal, with, all, with the end goal of resourcing people to engage in meaningful work while being able to support themselves. Um, vocational rehab, um, certification, all of these things will help for people to return to work and get jobs where they actually can support themselves rather than subsisting because if, for those who can uh, who, and who want the opportunity, they should have the same opportunities as anybody else who's in the system. A greater voice for those who have been marginalized in response to the actions taken by the state and agencies that are supposed to serve them. Um, I can look and I can go into a rundown inner city neighborhood and see like there are lots of people who are walking around who don't have jobs. My assumption is they all need jobs. Um, so I've been in, in, institute a jobs training program. That's great. They all go through the jobs training program and still no one gets a job. Why? Because I never talked to the people who were receiving that service to find out that the reason they didn't have jobs is because there was no daycare. No one had any daycare and there was crappy transportation from where they lived. So the jobs program was just a, money that, a bunch of money that I threw in that did nothing. Um, so, and also access to training and certification as a means of rehabilitation, creating peer and resourcing centers with respite beds, seeing the flow of tide to inpatient care. Um, expanding the net of peer services, engaging with, with other with with areas other than AHS, serving communities with co-occurring issues, and relief and the realization of patient rights in an atmosphere that is supportive, at the minimum, of shared decision making without the threat of coercion and the least and in the least restrictive environments possible. But um, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Scott Akis, I'm the Executive Director of Collaborative Solutions, um, and thank you for having me. Good. Uh, I passed out. I'm just going to introduce you. I um, mean, yeah, I'll interrupt you, excuse sure. me, Scott, and say, um, Lori Emerson, the pe some people have houses that certain people are testifying and other people are not. Um, your name, along with others, was provided by Larry Emerson uh, to recommend to us. Uh, and I'm, what process went into that? Is, I'm sure I, I, can, I can talk to that. Well, just uh, briefly, I don't want to interrupt Scott yeah, too far, but I just I just realized that some people, I had somebody said, well, I have no idea what Collaborative Solutions is and why are they testifying? I'm in the right place. <laughs> yeah. and, right. So you. our co sponsors were able to sign up to uh, for testimony. I forwarded all those requests onto chairs to select who they would like. Um, we were lucky to get everybody that was on the list. <laughs> so uh, that was the process. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Good. So we're all, we're in, Absolutely. For those thank who don't you know for having us. Solutions are we're in the paper. You're here. Scott, say so your name again so I can ask properly. Sure, Scott Akus, and uh, from Collaborative Solutions. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Lori, for recommending. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Is everyone comfortable? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We get glasses of water. I'm sorry we don't. We sometimes have a picture of water and glasses. I'm sorry we don't have that today. But, uh, we uh, so, uh, I am from Collaborative Solutions Corporation. I'm the executive director there. Collaborative Solutions is known um, uh, most frequently for running the second spring programs. And I've provided, for those who don't uh, know exactly what we do, I've provided some information in the first few pages of the handout. So you can see that as a whole, we have 27 beds. It's recovery-based, trauma-informed care. We've been running since 2007. We have a very close relationship with the designated agencies, and um, we have grown a lot. Uh, we started out as a 14-bed program. We now have 27 beds, um, and there's a reason for that. And so my hope is that by the end of my testimony today, we may be able to do some lessons learned on the Collaborative Solutions experience in the mental health system here in Vermont. Uh, so we have three facilities. As you look, uh, we like to call them homes. As you look through the uh, booklet, you can get a little bit of a snapshot of each one. Our original uh, home in, in uh, Williamstown and Second Spring North, which is 
actually sort of closer to Underhill than Westford, but it has a Westford address. So, um, and then finally Pierce House, which is a very small program with three beds, very individually tailored program, and I'm going to get back to that later on. Uh, it was established in 2016. We have very intensive clinical care, and we're very proud of the excellence of that care. Um, so the care that's provided in home, so that the, the typical length of stay for our folks is about nine months. It, it ranges all over the map. It can be as little as three. It can be 15 or 18. And most of our folks have a um, some label uh, diagnosis of um, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, severe bipolar disorder, or some of the other more serious um, labels that um, are applied. Um, so uh, what we're able to provide from a clinical perspective is on-site psychiatry. We have psychiatrists uh, who come to um, the homes at least weekly. Uh, we have a primary care, APRN, who's able to prescribe and who cares for the um, medical needs of our residents. We have nursing care every day um, and round the clock nursing uh, on call um, as well as physician and therapy uh, on call. We have case management, psychotherapy, vocational rehab, creative arts therapy. We used to have a music therapist, now it's a drama therapist, and that's a well loved program. Um, substance uh, use disorder. Oh, nice. There we go. That's great. Thanks. Do I have control of that? Yes. Yes, yes. you absolutely do. <laughs> How long have I got? <laughs> Seven more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I might actually ditch this. Um, that's super yeah, I, I didn't realize you had submitted one, so I'm sorry. Not to yeah, 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 thanks so much. Um, uh, we provide uh, peer support and collaboration with Vermont Psychiatric Survivors, um, who is a great partner of ours, uh, and we coordinate with um, scores of off-site uh, providers. So uh, what is our impact on the system as a whole? I wanted to take a look at that. So there you have our utilization rates. You see the um, straight line across the, uh, just above the squiggly line. That's 100%. I don't know if you can read those numbers. Sorry. Um, but we're typically in the mid-90s with our utilization. Uh, there's been a little bit of a dip over the past six months. I'm not sure exactly what that's about. But we're pretty much full. Um, and so that's 27 beds. You know, we normally have 25 of them full. Usually the, um, the couple of beds that may not be full are, are not full because somebody has just moved out and we're waiting for somebody to come out of the hospital. And, and so that, that leaves a little bit of um, lag time there. Uh, we are, uh, even with the intensity of clinical services that we offer, um, we're extremely cost conscious. Um, and uh, come in under $900 per bed day, and I have a comparison there. Those are 2017 figures. The more recent ones I've seen are similar. Um, so uh, recently, our bed day costs over the past four years have gone down really significantly. Any guesses as to why? It's because our utilization is up. So the cost of, so we're actually running on the same uh, uh, pot of funds, but the number of people who are with us has gone up. So those are folks who are not in the hospital, but are actually using our services. So uh, the divisor is larger. Yes. I had to consult fourth grade math. <laughs> so, um, so it, I think by all accounts, um, this has been an incredibly successful uh, program. Uh, it, when people came up with it in 2007, it was a collaborative effort. And it always just warms my heart to hear how Second Spring was born um, out of a community collaboration that involved people served, family members of people served, NAMI, psychiatric survivors, um, as well as providers and professionals. And I think that a lot of the success in the way that the program has been set up to be able to accomplish for the system of care, um, what it has been accomplishing is due to the fact that it was set up by people who knew what they were talking about. 
from real life. Um, so what are the lessons we can learn from that? I, I'm gonna, I wanna move to that, but uh, before I do, I wanna talk a little bit about our mission. Um, so this is our mission statement. It's to create caring communities where people seeking mental health, people who are out looking for mental health, they find hope, compassion, and excellent clinical care. Those are equally important, hope, compassion, and excellent clinical care. So um, I have a couple of pictures under engagement. Um, I think what I wanna say about the compassion and engagement part is that um, what puts somebody at risk of not doing well at Second Spring is when we can't, uh, and, and we, we actually have staff members in, in the room today, so it's really like, it's really great to be able to talk about this um, and, and see the look of recognition. Um, what, what causes us to not be able to be successful with somebody is when we can't reach them. We can't figure out what is that path in. How, how can we engage with them? How can we be compassionate towards them? We're doing everything we can here. We're being nice. We're looking for you know, hooks in there, and we just can't figure out. In our context, with seven other people present or 15 other people present, we can't find a way in. And those are the people that we lose. Um, and that's a sad day every time it happens. So um, I, when we talk about compassion, you know, I, I think what I want to say is when I ask if people were comfortable here, um, I intended that actually to be a part of this. Um, so uh, people who have mental health um, diagnoses have a history for thousands of years and in most um, places on earth of being alienated from the cultures, um, from their home cultures. And this is um, a sad but true fact of civilization, not just Western civilization, but worldwide. Um, and so when we try to reach out and form a community, remember the mission statement, with folks who have uh, these labels, um, uh, it, it is challenging. There, there can be a lack of trust there because there pe people have been excluded and alienated from families, cultures, towns, schools, um, and most of our institutions. Um, so when we reach out and try to engage with folks, that is um, a sometimes quite difficult because um, of a person's uh, personal history, and B, it's the key. That's that we're not gonna get clinical care unless people don't feel alienated, unless people do feel comfortable where they are, even if it's a little hot. Um, second thing, hope. I'm gonna look at this slide a little bit more in more detail. Um, so this is um, the stages of recovery at Second Spring. And you'll see the block of three bars on the far left. That's when people enter. Um, I'm sorry, I switched this around. Um, this is people who were expressing no interest in recovery. Now we know probably underneath there, there probably is an interest in recovery, but there's, they're not to the point where they can even talk about that, right? When people, prior to being admitted to Second Spring, 54% of the people are expressing no interest in recovery verbally. By the time they've been with us for a week, that number's dropped to 32%. And by the time they graduate, that number's dropped to 10%. People talking about recovery, maybe not doing a lot of action on it yet, we've got 25% are talking about recovery from the hospital environment before they're admitted with us. 30% um, are talking about recovery by the time they've spent a week with us. And 14% are talking about recovery by the time of graduation. As you can see, the pattern continues through trying options. I'm not gonna walk you through that, but actively pursuing recovery. I've committed to recovery. I'm trying everything I can. I'm taking advantage of whatever resources I, I can find in my environment. 7% um, um, of the people are there prior to coming to us. 42% of the people are there by the time they graduate. So there's an enormous leap in hope, in the hope that's being expressed and actually played out in people's actions during the time that they're with us. 
I want to um, spend just a couple of minutes talking about um, one particular story. We have a three-bedroom program, and it is designed um, to uh, look very to support very specifically three individuals. So it's less of a sort of institutional environment, and more it's it's in a house, and we work with those individual with those individuals to figure out specifically what their needs are, and not having anything to do with the organizational environment of a 14 or 16 bed program. Um, we so have an individual so there. Isaac, we're we're, we're going to need to try to bring this to some closure shortly because we have other witnesses that we. Sure. Hear from just okay. So I can. I mean, I'm not. I, I'm trying to find this balance between getting one off and um, being respectful that we have sure. other folks who wish. Let to me not tell the story. <laughs> Let me just tell you that when you reach out to somebody, it works. Okay, that's the point of the story, um, and that that's not always possible in a uh, 16 bed mental health facility. Um, and that uh, while these, um, while the intensive, intensive residential programs are highly effective, we believe that there's a place for more of those that will be successful. Um, what needs to happen is, see this pie chart, we need the 21% that are ending up back at the hospital, we need to reach those guys. How can we do that? How can we reduce the size of that piece of the pie and increase the size of the orange piece? Well, here are the special populations we're working with. We've gone from 25% opioid, sorry, 25% substance use disorder to 85% since the time when we opened. 1% opioids to 37% of our population has opioid addiction. We have a younger population, fewer people over 53, more who are, who are under 27. Um, in fiscal year uh, 19, 25% of the residents used in ambulances in the ER were admitted to the hospital for non-psychiatric reasons. So we have a real uh, medical need. We have a very medically needy population. So if we're going to build our system, can anybody guess, remember this pie chart? Where do you think that blue triangle is coming from? I'll tell you. It's coming from people who are in the populations that we're not able to reach because we have a sort of one size fits all situation. So people with severe medical needs are very difficult to serve. They don't always feel like they're, all their needs are being cared for. People with LGBTQ identity, um, that's a very difficult um, thing in certain circumstances depending on who their fellow residents are. Dual diagnosis, substance use disorder, mental health, um, those with significant forensic um, histories or potential for violence, and those with a labeled diagnosis of um, personality disorder. Those are all very challenging populations, not because of themselves, but because the, the home has been built for a very specific type of resident. Those coming out of the hospital with schizophrenia, sort of your classic uh, mental, uh, mental health psychiatric um, patient. So the takeaways, I'm wrapping up, are um, that, when, that when Collaborative Solutions does its good stuff, its heart-oriented stuff, Vermont does well, like financially, right? It pays when we do the right thing. We have people, by the way, calling from across the country asking how we're doing this. Um, and that's because it makes sense financially. But it's also the right thing. Um, we have uh, success in both of those cases requires adequate resources. Um, we, uh, if we're able to produce more intensive residential beds, it'll mean there's less ER boarding and less hospitalization. But they can't, here's the, here's the crux of it, it can't just be any beds. They have to be beds people wanna be in. So what are the beds people wanna be in? How are we gonna plan that? If we were to decide we're gonna do a new IRR for the state of Vermont, who's sitting at the table? Remember who was sitting at the table when Second Spring was born? 
right? That's who we got to put at the table, and maybe even a little bit more of a specialized group. Maybe making sure that we're including people who have not had a great experience at some of the uh, residential facilities. People who fit some of these, you know, uh, uh, minority group um, uh, bullet points here to help us craft something that's going to work for them. Um, and so with that, I'll conclude the presentation. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, thank you so much. I would also uh, just pose the question not to be answered now because we do need to continue to move on, but uh, to invite you to help us think about how perhaps members of our community or our committee uh, might be able to have a first-hand opportunity to visit, knowing how to respect patient privacy and all the things that must be thought about. But there's nothing like a first-hand opportunity to visit that makes uh, the world that you're working in become alive. Thrilled and honored to. So I throw that out there as a possibility. My name is Karen Crowley, and I'm here from the Vermont Cooperative of Practice Improvement and Innovation, which is part of Northern Vermont University, to talk to you about a collaborative approach to workforce development for mental health and or substance use, which may take up my entire time to give you all of so those I, I'm really going to ask you to hold it to 10 minutes. Absolutely. Because I'm going to be respectful to other ways. I will absolutely be quick, just to give you a few highlights. Um, because our program is relatively new. In fact, Sarah Spurl was the first executive director just a few years ago. Um, and because she believes in collaborative approaches to mental health and substance use. So we are a statewide collaborative that represents higher education, mental health and substance use providers, state agencies, hospitals, professional associations, peers, those with lived experience, pretty much anybody who has a stake in the system of care and would like to help figure out how to make the best improvements. Um, so we are focused on trying to build the highest quality of services and utilize the economies of scale by working together as that collaborative. So our members pitch in time, money, expertise, great ideas, and we build things together. Um, many of them, things that have come up today in the conversations. So the priorities that we set are based on what our members are telling us are important to them. Um, and then the membership has the opportunity to steer some things in the various settings that they're in. Um, so we have done a number of things as we do that. Um, one is that we provide a lot of training to that very broad um, constituency that we have. We also provide coaching, consultation, learning communities. Um, again, the members decide what is it that we should be building that's going to serve our community best. We research and assess evidence-based practices, and what might work well here in Vermont, what do our membership feel like we're missing, where are the gaps. Um, in fact, when Scott was just talking about that specific population, one of the newest things that we're doing in the state is recovery-oriented cognitive therapy, which comes out of the University of Pennsylvania. So people in the mental health designated agencies have been receiving a lot of training and consultation on that one. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that we do. We also, I have a list of some of our most uh, recent projects on the back, but Six Core Strategies is one of those. So we bring in those expert trainers and coordinate that process. Um, we are also, we're part of Northern Vermont University because of the fact that they and the Vermont State College system is so committed to figuring out ways to make sure that their programming is serving the community as a whole. So they have a lot of questions about, you know, what should our coursework be in order to fit the needs, especially around substance use and mental health. Um, and they use our membership as that vehicle. So there's engaged conversations with anybody and everybody, the people who are receiving services, the people providing them, um, to make those kinds of decisions together. So for an example, one of the things we've recently been working, working on is how can we package some of what is in um, master's degrees at Northern Vermont University so that we're focusing on the specifics that need to be um, taken in order to meet substance use licensure. Um, not necessarily sprinkling them all over several years, but you know, how can we package this together with courses, workshops, um, and that's the kind of innovation that we're doing with them that we find 
to be very exciting and thrilling. Um, we do put things online. We are in the middle of launching a learning management system, and that platform will allow us to do more online, but we also hear very clearly from our members that they do not want just online training um, and opportunities. They really want to connect. They want face-to-face. -face. They want to have options as to how it is that they receive. Um, I think that as I was listening to people today, one of the things that's really clear is we have this particular mission and agenda, um, but if somebody asked you know, how I spend most of my days, it's in connections. It's talking with everybody who's doing everything in order to figure out where those connections are and keeping the membership, all of that flowing. Um, so when Christopher stopped me in the hallway today and he was talking about that vote rehab idea, I was able to say, hey, I'm going to hook you up with this woman from the Department of Labor that has this new grant and she wants to vote. So those kinds of things happen among our membership all the time. Um, just something else to be aware of, and I don't have an ask here. I figure that you'll or I'll figure out how you can be helpful if you understand what we're trying to do. Um, but we are currently working to apply for a USDA grant that focuses on increasing telepresence capacity in rural communities in order to help those communities thrive. So our collaborative group has been working together to figure out a strategic way that sites across the state, everybody from recovery centers to designated agencies to libraries, wherever it is that the membership decides makes the most sense, they will be receiving telepresence equipment that is top-notch stuff that I don't think anybody in Vermont has yet, um, and the training to make use of it, and then own that equipment going forward. So it's, it's kind of a gift to Vermont. Um, so we are in the midst of doing that. We're still looking for match um, on that one, and we're waiting for the announcement to officially come out. We have a grant writer at NVU. Um, we have the technology. We have the um, distance learning people. So we figure we're going to have a good proposal. So I'd like you to know that. And then on the back, there is just um, some information about who's been working on that grant and a few of our initiatives so that people have some idea of what we're focused on, which, as I said, is pretty clearly some of the things that people have been talking about here today because our members despite what's important. And that's that. Thank you. It's very good to know about that. Uh, my name is Joellen Ferrallo. I'm the executive director of the Center for Health and Learning. We're a 5013C uh, that's been around in Vermont for 20 years. We bring capacity to state initiatives that address priority health issues. We were the lead designated agency on behalf of Department of Mental Health for two youth suicide prevention grants um, that started in 2008 and ended in 2014. Since that time, we built out the Vermont Suicide Prevention Center, which is a public-private partnership with the Agency of Human Services and a number of foundations that we build projects out with donors. Um, about 50% of our budget comes from a base allocation from Department of Mental Health for $190,000, and that is what we have done our work on. And we build out the rest of our budget um, to double that, to focus on suicide prevention, to try and keep, um, keep a focus on the issue. Um, we are guided by a coalition that is cross-sector, across education, human services, community providers, healthcare, and uh, highly represented by people with lived experience. Um, so, we hear about two to three suicides a week in Vermont. We hear about most of them um, because of our You Matter for Schools, which has been uh, designated as a national best pro practice program. We often provide initial response to schools in the form of resources and ensure they're connected to their designated agencies who go in and do life-saving work. Because what we know about suicide <coughs> is that postvention, what happens after an event, is critical to prevention. Thing is, we want to get upstream of that and we want to divert the crises. So I do want to say that suicide is complex. And I'm going to speak briefly about healthcare today, 
but it really requires comprehensive solutions. It cannot sit just on the shoulders of mental health alone, certainly. Um, and it requires very integrated pathways between mental health and health care. And the kinds of innovative uh, community health teamwork and hospital um, teamwork that we're seeing in communities where they're connecting with the kind of organizations who are in this room where there hasn't been a strategy that's presented that isn't part of a comprehensive suicide prevention system. Um, those are really, really great and really effective um, because we know that the demographics at risk for suicide often have social determinant issues which need to be addressed. So the extent that healthcare connects with those kinds of social services in an integrated approach is really, really um, important. And it's starting to happen with some good models in Vermont. I will point to the Northeast Kingdom whose um, CEO of their, their hospital has absolutely um, put some, some really great track in place for community partnerships across sectors. So um, the solutions are, the, the issue is complex. I do want to say that underlying suicide in, in the research, and we've been doing this progressively for 10 years now, there are three major individual level risk factors, precursors. Feeling alone, feeling a burden or feeling hopeless because of a lack of personal purpose, and feeling isolated. So the extent to which we make connections between people in family systems, between family systems and human services, between human services and mental health and healthcare, and within healthcare, the more likely we're going to be able to build a system of care that um, can prevent suicide. And of course, the connection to co-occurring issues, such as substance misuse, it's estimated that 50% of suicides have a substance misuse component. So it's all connected. Um, so everything we do to strengthen a system of care for suicide prevention, and, and I believe there's a very, really sophisticated model called zero suicide, um, also contributes to building Vermont's system of care, mental health system of care. And there really isn't anything in the overall plan that um, Commissioner Squirrel has laid out that isn't vital for suicide prevention in the long run. Yeah. The issue with health care is a double, double whammy. The first thing is that most of the people who die by suicide are not engaged in the health care system. And then, so that's the question, is how do we create a system that's empathic and responsive and timely and you know engages with people? And then the second thing is that very often when somebody seeks care in the healthcare system, it's not at this point in time prepared to respond with evidence-based uh, practices and a pathway that's going to ensure they don't fall off the pathway somewhere. So those connections, care coordination, follow-up, that's all really critical. So I asked the healthcare, um, the, the, this committee, to support the allocation in the governor's budget for zero suicide, which is a set of evidence-based practices that comes out of some national initiatives that show that with these evidence-based practices, you could actually bring suicide in a healthcare system down from very high to zero, and then keep it at a very, very low level. Um, so we would ask you to do that and also to leverage any influence you have with one care and with the blueprint to work with our designated agency system um, to continue to keep our independent providers um, looped in so they also have the skills to do evidence-based approaches to suicide assessment. And I'd like to say that in the research, hands down, Evidence-based approaches to screening and assessing patients trumps professional, non-structured approaches every time. So it is important that we provide 
the kinds of tools that show outcomes and that are collaborative in safety planning. So it's it's the with us, we're doing this together. Um, ultimately, it's the patient who has to um, ensure their own safety after the, the period of crisis. I, I want to make one other point, and then I will say that I'll save the lessons learned on how to effectively do zero suicide uh, in a system of care for the presentation on February 13th at Suicide Prevention Day. But we are learning a lot about the need to identify specific subpopulations and their particular risk and protective factors. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, youth, uh, new Americans and refugees, um, middle-aged and older Vermonters, LGBTQ, incarcerated people, veterans, um, each of these subpopulations have particular risk factors, and some of those are unique, and therefore the strategies and recommendations we use for them in culturally appropriate clinical care are really important, and we're starting to put more emphasis on that in terms of um, providing support and workforce development um, in the field. So again, all these approaches uh, increase connection, and connection underlies every protective factor for suicide on an individual and a systems level. Um, we look forward to working with you further and, and thank this committee very much for the support you can give to suicide prevention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you for taking some time to listen to talk with you this morning about our uh, psychiatric urgent care for kids program in Bennington. I'm Lauren Maturna. I'm the executive director of United Counseling Service. Um, I'm sure that you're all aware of our statewide crisis that our emergency departments are experiencing as a result of overutilization for mental health supports. I was in here earlier when uh, Secretary Squirrel talked about 10,000 Vermonters going into the ED for screening or mental health support, and that 50% of them left the emergency department without service or without a treatment plan. And so in Bennington, we're no different. And so Southern Vermont Medical Center and United Counseling Service uh, got together and started talking about how we could affect change for those with uh, mental health crisis. And we know that the intervention during an intimate, uh, mental health crisis is often more traumatic um, when we send them to the places they should stay out of, which is the emergency department. And more uh, concerning to UCS and uh, Southern Vermont Medical Center was the rising number of children that were in the emergency department. The experience of being removed from the classroom, often by the police department, and then being transported in a police car the arrival, evaluation, and stay in the emergency department is often traumatizing, and sending to kids to the emergency department is really um, unnecessary. So when we got together about 18 months ago to start talking about um, what can we do to affect change for kids and their mental health, um, we were looking at some data. And what we learned at the time was that in the fourth quarter of 2018, there were 294 assessments completed at the emergency department. 82% of the children that were assessed were sent home without a treatment plan. Without this, a, this is for men. This is in Bennington specifically. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, you yes, 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 much larger group of you're talking yes. about just Bennington in, a, in four quarters, or in the fourth quarter. The average length of stay is two, 20 hours, and sometimes kids are in the emergency department for 31 days. Again, just in Bennington. Uh, now imagine if those kids didn't have to go there in the first place. And so along with our partners, we applied for and received a one-time funding innovation grant from OneCare to start up what we um, have referred to as the Psychiatric Urgent Care for Kids, or PUC. So what is PUC? Uh, PUC is a child and family-centered, recovery-oriented, trauma-informed approach that is designed to keep children out of the emergency department while providing a therapeutic environment that offers the right level of care for kids. Once, um, rather than calling the police, 
schools are calling our family emergency services, being able to get assessed as to whether or not it's appropriate for them to go to the emergency department. Majority of the time, for the kids that we've seen, it is not appropriate. And so rather than going to the emergency department, our staff is driving a child from the school to Puck and being able to be in an environment that you see here on your right. And then being able to receive supports from a uh, master's level clinician who can assess where they're at, provide screenings for things like anxiety, depression, suicidality, uh, trauma, psychiatric consultation, either to the family or to the child's primary care physician. As you know, there's a psychiatry shortage as well, so uh, primary care physicians are often prescribing psychiatric medication to children. And being able to have a psychiatrist who can consult with them is a much better way to be able to use our limited resources. They can also um, participate in having a complete intake. So when their family comes to the urgent care center, they can have same day intake for services ongoing if that's necessary. Information referral, the development of a crisis plan, parent and family meetings, among other things, including follow up with uh, the sending school for consultation and determine how the child is doing uh, in the school after going to pot. We also have a sensory room that allows for children to use sensory tools that are often used to help learning new coping skills be able to um, provide a moment of calm, particularly for individuals who are agitated or distressed. And um, that's anywhere from kids yoga to the sand tray, um, and a, you can see a swing and a body sock that helps with movement and resistance that really helps kids learn to calm and to kind of get that kind of agitation um, settled in their body. And I want to tell you about our, actually one of our first kids that came to the psychiatric urgent care um, at the beginning of the school year. She's an eight-year-old girl, and for the first 10 days of school this year, she could not sit and attend in the classroom. She could not participate in any of her academics. She was running in the hallways. She was banging her head. She was really very much in distress. Our psychiatric, our family emergency services staff went to the school, made an assessment to bring her to Puck. And while there, she was a, we were able to meet with her father, do a complete intake, have a psychiatric consultation with her primary care physician, and at that time, it was discussed and agreed to change her medication. She was able to um, uh, access a clinician, access those sensory tools, and start learning different ways of um, dealing with her own trauma and anxiety. And she was there for about four hours, but it was in a, a very relaxed and comfortable environment that's therapeutic without the distress of going to the emergency department. She was able to go back to school uh, when we did follow up and did an observation uh, in the school the next day. She was absolutely, she was attending. She was accessing her education. Now, doesn't mean that she stays there. It doesn't mean that she doesn't need ongoing treatment, but she stayed out of the emergency department because if she went once, she's more likely to go again and again and again. And so, uh, you know, we know that we have not, um, that child has not been in the emergency department for the school year. And it's a trauma to go to the emergency mm -hmm. department. It absolutely is. And, what, you know, because, of course, yeah. everyone. So, of course, once you're in the emergency department, even if there's nothing medically wrong with you, they have to do the whole complete medical clearance, which also means as a child, it could be a nine-year-old child who has to disrobe, put on a hospital johnny, all their, all their uh, possessions are taken, they're in a sterile room, and they wait, and then they get prodded and poked and talked to, and then six hours later, because we all know we've been there, six hours later they go home because they didn't need to be there in the first place, and it is very traumatizing. And so when we wrote the grant to One Care, um, our anticipated outcomes were a reduction of the emergency department admissions by 20%. A reduction in the average length of stay by 50%. So we do have kids that end up in the emergency department either because schools don't call us first and they just send them, um, or they really need to be there. And what we've started to do also is those kids that started in the emergency department and really didn't necessarily need to go anywhere else, they come to Puck right afterwards. So then we are able to then have them see a clinician have them a family meeting, have them have an intake for services right uh, at that time. 
We um, anticipate a reduction in the cost of unnecessary ED admission and improve the patient experience as reported by uh, patients and caregivers. What we know now for stats is that we have seen a 40% reduction in ED utilization for children. Children are receiving the right level of care. 100% of the parents and caregivers actually are talking about how they're much more satisfied with their service and feel really good about the service that they received. And only 23% of the children that we saw in crisis were actually sent to the emergency room. Sure. Can you, can you ask people, would you have the staff person to ask people in the hall to please reduce the Of the children that we've seen in crisis, only 23% have been in the emergency department. Uh, cost savings, as you see, is to be determined. We're working on that. It's really rather complicated uh, to identify what the cost savings um, are and make sure that we get the numbers right. Um, and uh, we hope that uh, we continue to provide the service. The grant that we received from One Care was $125,000 that helped um, start the program. It's not to sustain the program. And um, so we obviously we need uh, funding. Um, we have had great relationships with our local police department, with our local hospital, and we know that that will continue to grow. After this morning and listening to Commissioner Squirrel, we believe and we know that um, this supports the 10-year plan for the mental health plan, uh, looking at the quadruple aim of decreasing cost, increasing caregiver experience, increasing client experience, and increasing overall health absolutely aligns with the quadruple aim um, and also aligns with the recommendation of alternatives to the emergency department. And so uh, we are excited about the possibility of, of moving forward and expanding and um, hope that that happens. And um, just very quickly, you, you saw these dolls. I just want to tell you very quickly what that's about. We um, actually received these dolls in a collaboration with the Vermont Art Exchange and the Vermont School for Girls, which is a residential program. They make these dolls. They donate them to us. In there, the heart, in the pocket, is a message from an older child that's in the residential to a younger child in Puck, basically saying that you can make it, I did, I did too, and these people will help you. And the children who come into Puck, if they want to take one home with them, they can have it and take it home with them. So thank you for allowing me to share um, about thank this very important. My story, I'm gonna tell you how my story is <clears throat> of why Peer support is very crucial in the workplace. My life was like living in the dark. I could not see the light at the end of the tunnel. I didn't want to come out of my house. I wanted to stay in my enclosed box. With the help of my team and peer support, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be where I am today. I was in and out of hospitals, I didn't care about life. I thought everything would be better off if I wasn't here. I was told to do DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, and recovery. I thought everybody on my team was nuts, thinking about classes would help me, but I took them anyway, even though I hated to. The process is not easy, I would take two steps forward and two steps forward and one step back. And if it wasn't the faith of my team, I consider peers my team, I would not be where I am. The process took years, little by little, I could see the light at the end of the tunnel. If it wasn't for peer service, I would never be able to get the job at the soup kitchen. I just wanted, I used to work at National Life in the Treasure Space during the bar that's it. So, in the Treasury Division. Thank you. So, this was a different process compared to where I was at. And then, during the soup kitchen, I did the catering for Sunrise. And my supervisor told the supervisor of support team that I might be a good fit to drive clients around to doctor's appointments, grocery shopping, because I was a peer. 
When the support team had an opening, I interviewed for a part-time position of Washington County, and I accepted the position. I was doing such a good job, my supervisor trusted me enough to be the backup for assist team. Assist team is where you go deliver meds to clients. Sorry. There was staff back um, when I first started as a support person that was telling the supervisor that I that they shouldn't have hired me for the position. But um, the people knew me when I wasn't well, so they were actually. of me not well compared to how far I went in my recovery. And I have, I like to, I felt like I had to show everybody they were wrong, that I was getting better. I was asked to do the position of team at Maple House. It was a big step for me, but I like challenges. <laughs> And Maple House is a place where we have two beds. We have a Maple House bed, which is a crisis bed. But it's more than just a crisis bed. It's also a co-occurring because the people that do come into our bed has co-occurring issues. And we also have a transitional bed that's a 30-day stay for a homeless person. But being peer-to-peer, -peer, people under we understand people better than I'd say something that came out of college. They're book smart, but not common sense smart. <laughs> well, well said. <laughs> <laughs> that my supervisor for the coordinator for assistance support stepped down. I applied for the position and got the job. My new title is Oh my God, sorry. Coordinator. 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 <laughs> Fear. Fear support. Fear support. I supervise 16 people. Uh, I do half and half, half of Maple House and half of assistance support. And the staff and peers that help me accomplish a life worth living for myself and others. I think peer services are crucial to helping um, clients or guests in everyday life. The guests or client feels comfortable because staff have lived experiences they can relate to their issues. The strength of having crisis beds, which we don't have enough of, because we need more funding. <laughs> there are run, I want it all run by Please stop by the governor's office on your way out. <laughs> are they, gonna, yeah. are they gonna let me in with the security guards out there? Uh, <laughs> send our own guards. Yeah. <laughs> We, uh, peers can actually understand what the guest is going through, and they support and not judge. They share parts of their recovery story. Takes away, this helps take away from isolation and not feeling alone. My census. I think that we should have a lot more crisis beds run by peers. because this will help not be in, into the ED, which costs a lot of money. And our peer staff makes our crisis bed unique and valuable because we can relate to the client's guests. So we have a better understanding, so if they say, you don't know what I'm going through, we can say, yes, we do. So <clears throat> my, I would like to have more crisis beds around 
the central Vermont area because we really, the only peer run bed is at 98th Street Montpelier, we have one bed. And that's very hard to, if you have two, three people that need to step down from the ED or before going to the ED, and we don't have space. So if you can think about or just talk about a little <laughs> funding, because I know it's very hard because there's not a lot of money out there. But you, we can save you money. We can save lots of money from having more crisis beds than ED and before going to the ED. I think what I'd like to do, we have a few minutes still. Uh, I don't know Isaac by sight. Isaac's not here. Isaac's not here. Okay. No, she's outside. Let me just check. Uh, I, we had indicated we didn't know that we would have time, but um, I'm respectful of the Isaac is here, that we hear from him. Uh, we're checking to see Kelly DeForge ask to be heard, and if she's... She has to do testimony. Okay, well, there's lots of things going on in other committees. The Senate Health and Welfare Committee is also hearing from uh, folks today. Um, let me... Uh, Courtney, are we still here? Because Courtney has... It's left the building. <laughs> yeah. left the building. But I want to just uh, maybe bring to our attention, I heard you submitted written testimony. And as I've looked at it, I've not looked at it closely, uh, but I see that amongst the things she intended to talk about was the importance of school-based uh, access for services. That's something which I know that we all are uh, very interested in. So I just ask the committee members to uh, take a look at her testimony as well. Um, I think I'd like to just maybe say a few words and then bring us to a close for the morning. Um, this is not going to be a surprise to anyone, but this is, these are issues that are near and dear to my heart, personally and professionally. Um, some of you know I worked in the community mental health system from 1973 to 1996. And Tina, I worked my way up from a part-time summer day camp provider to eventually being the executive director of the Counseling Service of Addison County. Uh, and I say that because I congratulate you on continuing to take on new challenges. What we're, what we're faced with here in Vermont is uh, Again, I'll bring us back to what we, where we started this morning here from Commissioner Squirrel. How to move, we're, we're moving, we're collectively trying to move what is bigger than, bigger than a ship that isn't turning fast. It's much bigger than that. Um, because we're, we're simultaneously trying to move societal issues of discrimination, historic hurtful prejudices, having to do with everything from racism to, and you notice how many times LGBTQ issues are brought up. I have worked personally to try to change this shit for my entire lifetime. Uh, with some success here in Vermont, I think we had some success, significant success. But when I, I can't help but sit here and think of a young woman, and I'm acting as a witness now, and I'm unashamedly so. When a young adolescent girl wanted to do a school project, she said, I want to do a school project about what it means to be LGBTQ in the community. That was her way into finding out, to making contact. So they said, we should go talk to Bill Liver. So I sat down with her and I, she asked me questions and I talked about the things that outright Vermont, and I, you know, why we were, why it was important that she was at outright Vermont. And then I stopped and I said, tell me your story. She 
she had been admitted three times to an inpatient psychiatric unit in Vermont for suicide, serious suicide attempts. Never once in those inpatient admissions had she ever been asked anything that would allow her to reveal her personal struggle about being queer. Never once was she referred to outright for more. She went to an outpatient therapist who never said anything about it. And finally, she went to someone else who said, do you know that outright for more? And she went to outright for more. She said, it saved my life. Because Outright Vermont is committed to an affirming approach to LGBTQ queer youth. And I mention that only because that's a part of it. That's my world of commitment in mental health is driven from my own personal struggles of facing the discrimination and the fear of reaching out to the mental health system for what the mental health system might have done to me. I think there are a lot of people who are living in fear still. Fear for what the mental health system will do to them rather than how it can help them. And when I hear of suicides, I think of the number of people who have made attempts at suicide, which is a far, far greater number. And I think there's so much for us to do. There's so much for us to build on. But there's so much for us to do. There are many, many secrets around sexual abuse. There are many secrets about other kinds of life traumas that people live with on a daily basis. I know this from my work, from my work in the LGBTQ community, um, and from my own personal life. And so I commend each of you for keeping moving forward on a daily basis to finding ways to make change. I became a psychotherapist, a substance abuse counselor, and I wanted to become the supervisor because I wanted to influence the things that was happening. And then I became the supervisor. I wanted to figure out how to have more influence, and so I became the director of the, that section of mental health. And then I had an opportunity to become the executive director because I wanted to the metaphor for me is I kept wanting to paint on a bigger canvas. And I, and I sit here, I came into this building for the very first time to try to change health insurance access around alcohol and drug abuse because there really wasn't any. And that was many years ago. Now we were successful. And I, I, I just decided I wanted to share some of this with you sitting here to chair this committee that has responsibility around mental health. I came here because I wanted to make change. It's painfully frustrating to see how slow that change is at times. But it's profoundly satisfying when we do make change. And we have had the opportunity to make change, and we will make more change. And you will be frustrated with us because we don't get as far as we want to go. Believe me, we are frustrated. Uh, and I want to thank uh, I want to thank those who are continuing to do the work on the front lines. That that work informs our work here. We need to hear from you. We need to interact with you. Um, and I am confident that we will make more changes. Um, and I'm personally committed to doing that. I believe this committee is. Uh, and we will work with our colleagues to do what we can do without all the resources that we would like to have at hand. Uh, but uh, thank you for indulging my personal sharing. Uh,